this video I will be listing the top 5 most encouraging philosophers of all time. So in a previous video I have already listed the top 5 most scariest philosophers of all time. And this list was based on the extent in which these philosophers succeeded in making us feel insecure of our own existence. Luckily there are also some more positive and encouraging philosophers out there, although they sometimes appear to be the minority. In this video I will list the top 5 most encouraging philosophers based on the extent in which they succeed in encouraging us that there is value and meaning to life and that we can make something of our existence on earth, whatever situation we might find ourselves in. It must be noted though that this list is only based on the philosophers that I have personally encountered so far. So in case there are any philosophers that you would add to this list, then please let me know in the comments as well. The first philosopher on this list was called Viktor Frankl. He was a Holocaust survivor and in his book Man's Search for Meaning, Viktor Frankl shared the horrendous experiences that he had to go through while being imprisoned in a concentration camp. I believe that it is therefore all the more interesting that Viktor Frankl, after experiencing such hardships, uh, still managed to remain so hopeful and encouraging. Viktor Frankl believed that even in the worst moments, such as being imprisoned in a concentration camp, life can still be meaningful. And this is the case according to Viktor Frankl, because meaning is derived from taking actions to deal with the problems that one is facing. Viktor Frankl observed that it is not important what we want from life, but what life wants from us. And in relation to this he wrote, we had to learn ourselves and furthermore we had to teach the despairing man that it did not really matter what we expected from life, but rather what life expected from us. And according to Viktor Frankl, when life asks something from us, we have to answer by taking the right actions. And by doing so, we can e face even the most difficult circumstances, according to Viktor Frankl. Therefore, he wrote, Our answer must consist not in talk and meditation, but in right action and in right conduct. Life ultimately means taking the responsibility to find the right answer to his problems and to fulfill the tasks which it constantly sets for each individual. And in the concentration camps, Viktor Frankl observed that those that managed to succeed in facing these tasks and challenges presented by life head-on were much more likely to survive the horrors of the concentration camps. So meaning is derived from the way in which we deal with the problems that we are facing. I believe that this is a really encouraging idea because it really means that we have the capability to make the best of any situation basically. And that brings us to philosopher number two, which is Joseph Campbell. Joseph Campbell is one of my most favorite authors and philosophers of all time. And I believe that this is in part due to the fact that his philosophies are encouraging and positive. So even some of the most scariest philosophies out there are no match for their encouragement provided by Joseph Campbell. One such philosophy, for example, for which the ideas of Joseph Campbell can provide a positive twist is the philosophy presented by Ernest Becker. So Ernest Becker in his book The Denial of Death argued that there exists an important paradox within humanity. So on the one hand, man exists largely separated from nature and through his consciousness is almost a god. However, on the other hand, man is still merely a mortal animal. And Ernest Becker even argued that we have created entire religions and societies merely for us to be able to live with this horrible paradox. Joseph Campbell argued that we should basically embrace this paradox. So according to him, we should embrace our warm-like and also our god-like nature. And he argued that we must look for a new coordinated myth that can increase our connection with the world. He wrote, for example, that not the animal world, not the plant world, not the miracle of the sphere, but man himself is now the crucial mystery. Man is that alien presence with whom the forces of egoism must come to terms, through whom the ego is to be crucified and resurrected, and in whose image society is to be reformed. This image should then not be based on the narrow-minded ideals of a single nature or culture, but instead on something that connects all of mankind. Therefore he wrote, 
for the ideals and temporal institutions of no tribe, race, continent, social class, or century can be the measure of the inexhaustible and multifariously wonderful divine existence that is the life in all of us. And furthermore, although the image might be the same for all of mankind, the symbol that represents the image might differ depending on local circumstances and culture. Joseph Campbell wrote, therefore it is necessary for man to understand and be able to see that through various symbols the same redemption is revealed. The way to become human is to recognize the lineaments of God in all of the wonderful modulations of the face of man. In this sense, uh, Joseph Campbell did not see myths and religious as a mere coping mechanism to deal with the ultimate paradox of life. Instead, Joseph Campbell saw myths and mysteries as a way to connect with the world and with ourself. So, to connect the warm and the God within us. I believe that this is really encouraging because it really means that we should embrace our own nature completely. That brings us to philosopher number three, Henry David Thoreau. Thoreau was another extremely encouraging philosopher. So we often tend to believe that we need to acquire a certain amount of riches or a certain status or role within society to be happy. And Henry David Thoreau is encouraging in the sense that he believed that material possessions are not a necessary requirement for fulfillment or happiness. He even indicated that there are certain advantages to not being rich, namely that riches will only provide you with the ability to accumulate things that you do not need in the first place. And these possessions might then even distract one from the most important experiences of life. He wrote, for example, if you cannot buy books and newspapers, for instance, you are but confined to the most significant and vital experiences. You are compelled to deal with the material which yields the most sugar and the most starch. It is life near to the bone where the sweetest. You are defended from being a trifler. Superfluous wealth can buy superfluities only. Money is not required to buy one necessary of the soul. Moreover, Henry David Thoreau believed that every individual is capable to consciously improve his or her own life. Therefore, he wrote, which is one of my most favorite quotes actually, I know of mo no more encouraging fact than the unquestionable ability of man to elevate his life by conscious endeavor. Thoreau believed that this could be achieved through ad adjusting the way in which one experiences and sees the world. He wrote, therefore, it is something to be able to paint a particular picture or to carve a statue, and so to make a few objects beautiful. But it's far more glorious to carve and paint the very atmosphere and medium through which we look, which morally we can do. That connects quite nicely to philosopher number four, Marcus Aurelius. Whereas Henry David Thoreau focused on improving his life by going to the woods and living in solitude with only a few possessions, Marcus Aurelius, who was Roman Emperor from 161 to 180, approached this improvement, of course, from a completely different angle. Marcus Aurelius, he was not able to go to a forest and live all by himself. Instead, he was continuously surrounded by riches and all the temptations with which these unlimited resources come hand in hand. Instead of encouraging us to live properly with limited means, as Thoreau did, Marcus Aurelius taught us how to live properly with unlimited means and the ability to satisfy whichever wish one had. He argued that these possessions and capabilities do not equate happiness. Instead, he argued that happiness should come from within. It's really interesting to see that on the one hand, um, Henry David Thoreau who was rather well, a bit poor and had to go to a forest and live by himself. And Marcus Aurelius, one of the most powerful men on earth at the time, how they managed to draw the same conclusions despite of their differences in circumstances. Similarly to Henry David Thoreau, Marcus Aurelius believed that one could carve one's own atmosphere and that one is capable of designing one's own thoughts. So if negative thoughts arise because of a certain event, these thoughts do not arise because of the event itself, but from our perspective of the event. He wrote, if your distress has some external cause and is not the thing itself that troubles you, 
but your own judgment of it and you can erase this immediately. If it is something in your own attitude that distresses you, no one stops you from correcting your view. Aurelius encourage us to change how we interpret these events and we can interpret them in whichever way we want and thereby carve our own atmosphere as well, which I think is really encouraging. And that already brings us to the last philosopher on this list, which is Thomas Carlyle. It is possible that you are a bit less familiar with Thomas Carlyle. I don't think he was that famous. If you're interested in his philosophies, then I have some more videos about him on my channel. Um, so I think it's really interesting because in his book Sartor Resartus, Thomas Carlyle made one of the characters of the book, who was called Teufelsdruck, go through an, an, an interesting and encouraging transformation. So Teufelsdruck, after experiencing an extreme existential period in which he rejects all meaning, which can also be called the everlasting no, he still manages to entirely change his perspective, culminating in the everlasting yes. And Thomas Carlyle encourages us that such a transformation is possible and even logical for everyone to achieve. Thomas Carlyle, through his character Teufelsdruck, described a mode of constant fear resulting from an existential crisis. He wrote, I lived in a continual indefinite pining fear, tremulous, posthumous, apprehensive of I knew not what. It seemed as if all things in the heaven and earth were but boundless jaws of a devouring monster, where an eye palpitating waited to be devoured. But these fears and insecurities culminated in an outlook towards life characterized by an everlasting no. He wrote, to me the universe was all void of life, of purpose, of volition, even of hostility. It was one huge, dead, immeasurable steam engine rolling on in its dead indifference to grind me limb from limb. And as a result of all of these thoughts, Teufelsdruck concluded that life is merely an air image. However, then all at once a thought was presented to Teufelsdruck. And this thought was, Wherefore, like a coward, dost thou forever pip and whimper and go cowering and trembling? Despicable bibed. What is the sum total of the worst that lies before thee? Death? Well, death and say the pangs of Tophet too, and all that the devil and man may, will, or can do against thee. Hast thou not a heart? Canst thou not trample Tophet itself under thy feet, while it consumes thee? Let it come then, I will meet it and defy it. It appears to be a logical conclusion drawn from the idea that the world is only an air image. Why should one live in fear? And this thought of Teufelsdruck resulted in him rejecting the everlasting no and him, pro him protesting his insecurities and fears. Muscala wrote, Thus had the everlasting no peeled authoritatively through all the recesses of my being, of my me, and then it was it that my whole me stood up. A native God created majesty and with an emphasis recorded its protest. To Thomas Carlyle, such a protest is one of the most important events of life. He wrote, such a protest, the most important transaction in life, May that same indignation and defiance in a psychological point of view be fitly called. Thomas Carlyle was really encouraging because he believed that such a character, such as Teufelsdruck, could go from an immense existential crisis and could actually overcome this through a, a certain process. So thank you very much for watching. Uh, most of the philosophers on my list of the top five most scariest philosophers, they questioned the existence of any inherent meaning to our lives. And these top five encouraging philosophers do not necessarily deny this lack of meaning. Instead, they encourage us to make the best of this situation and to create, create meaning, even if meaning appears to be lacking altogether. And all of the philosophers listed in, in this video encourage us that every individual is capable of doing so, is capable of carving one's own atmosphere. Yeah, please let me know what you thought of this video and please also let me know which philosophers make it to your own personal top 5 of most encouraging philosophers.
So thanks again and I hope to see you in the next video.